Welcome to this, the 50th meeting of our FinTech for Breakfast meeting, which we have with Jemima Kelly from FT Alphaville. Jemima has been anchoring this now for over two years, and this is the first that we've done under the new circumstances where the CSFI is trying, as it were, to go virtual. Uh, we, we may make a few screw-ups, but in general, it seems to be working. This time, uh, we, we will have Jemima anchoring this, but we'll have my colleague, Leighton Hughes, who worked on the agenda for the meeting with her, adding his little two penneth worth. So let's start with what's been keeping you up at night, Jemima. Obviously, a lot has been going on with, within and without the boundaries of the coronavirus panic. So what's, what's, what do you pick out as being the most important issues of the last month? based on the agenda that you and Leighton have been working on? Oh, based on, based on that agenda rather than just in general? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, in, take, in, take it as you like. In general, I've, you know, one of the beauties of working for FT Alphaville is that we kind of adapt ourselves to whatever, you know, situation is in front of us. So I've actually been doing quite a lot on the actual research um, on coronavirus and, um, so one of the things that's been keeping me up at night, as you say, is just the way in which uh, some, of the, some of the kind of projections that have been made um, have been interpreted and misinterpreted and how it's kind of astonishing to watch the spread of misinformation online and, and the kind of continuation of it. I've never really observed it in such a kind of, um, uh, as such, it's, 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 it's hard, to, it's, I've never kind of observed it being so quite, quite so acute as this, I guess. Um, so, so there was this, this um, influential imperial paper, which I'm sure you've heard about, which kind of um, is said to have changed the policy both in the UK and the US because it had these quite dire projections for how many people would die from coronavirus if we carried on as we were going, uh, which was like in the millions in the US and uh, like up to 500,000 in the UK. And then this paper suggested that if we were to take mitigation measures, um, in other words, trying to slow the spread, um, but in a, in a, in a kind of um, somewhat kind of moderate way, we would reach about a quarter of a million deaths in the UK uh, and something like 1.2 million in the US. Uh, but if we went to full suppression mode, which is what we're in now, and the difference between the two being, yes, the, 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 the aggression of the measures, but also the aim of the measures, which under suppression mode is to get the reproduction number below one, meaning that it will, if, if, you, if, if each person is infecting fewer than one other person, then, if, and then eventually the, the, the mathematically the, 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 the curve will, will be flattened. So, uh, but, but so, so kind of this paper project painted these kind of went through these three scenarios of kind of doing nothing, mitigation and suppression. And there seems to have been a huge amount of confusion between suppression and mitigation. And so now that we're in suppression mode and the scientists behind this paper have said, oh, we're now looking at something like 20,000 deaths or fewer in the UK. The whole world thinks that they've like, changed their mind and they've changed their tune and oh we've you know and this is some pretext for saying you know they use that as a pretext for saying that you know this is all a kind of conspiracy and this is all, and we've been misinformed and everything but the, the the point is that the only reason that they're now projecting that number is that we've gone into the mode and that's what they projected in the paper so i've spent quite a lot of time looking at that and i'm now looking at another imperial paper so i've, I've become my fintech work has slightly uh taken I'm a looking, are you not looking at the oxford work I am looking at the Oxford work. There is an absolutely fascinating backstory that I, I assume you know as a journalist I do. between I the I Imperial see. crowd and the Oxford crowd, including court cases, including yeah. all sorts of. Uh, I've got a story about that. Where did you, I'm, I'm slightly alarmed that you already know about this because it might mean that my story isn't quite as uh, groundbreaking as I thought it was. <laughs> I, we all know about it. There is a blog. There is a blog which explains it all yes, in, in very, very poignant detail. Uh, love, yeah. of, love affairs gone wrong. Let's get back to fintech, however. So that's, so that's really been a bit of a distraction, not a lie. So my fintech work has has uh, taken a bit of a kind of uh, is on pause actually at the moment, really, because there's so much to write um, on the actual virus. 
Anyway, start start with with what uh, well perhaps Leighton can can begin by what do you what did you pick out when you were working on the agenda with with Jemima? Sure. So um, I my first uh, the first thing that I, I thought was really important was the um, the fact that this shouldn't undermine an open open economy and there'll be all sorts of excuses that countries can use to put up barriers and I think in terms of trade and in fintech in particular. There have been a lot more cross border. There's been a lot more cross border activity. Um, so Alipay um, and uh, Transferwise partnering, Klarna um, and Ant Financial, and things things like this. I've been watching, and I think just at the time that that sort of happened, we we may be sort of going into a slowdown, and that's quite worrying. Um, but other than that, I've just been I've been looking at uh, valuations and the M and A as well. So will this corona, will COVID nineteen act as a um, act as a uh, you know a reset on on uh, valuations? Okay, well let me let me push push ahead because I've got your agenda in front of me: new and digital banking, neo and digital banking, Revolut and Monzo uh, refute rumours of imminent collapse. We want to start there. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean that's we could, let let's start there for sure, um, and then we can come come up further. Uh, oh, I see, because you've kind of glossed over the thing that Leighton just said about the coronavirus must not destroy an open world economy. We can come back to that. Well, but you're all welcome to have a look at the uh, the video I put on, out on our website yesterday morning, which summarises some of these issues. I perhaps share, not I don't necessarily share Jemima's worldview on this. I really think that uh, doctors can worry about health, but economists have to worry about the global economy. And we are trashing the global economy we are trashing it so badly that we may well have a depression for the next five years and the death rate as a result of that will be almost as uh, as appalling as uh, the death rate from coronavirus that's my view it's not your view okay I, think, yeah. I, I actually have quite a lot of time for that view and i think um we really really do need to look at the potential health impact from the economic devastation that we're likely to see if this carries on for a really long In period. Russia, after the collapse of uh, the Soviet Union, male life expectancy fell by five years. I mean, it is absolutely horrendous what a collapse in the economy can do to death rates. No, I think so, that we really, really need to look seriously at that. And uh, I mean, there's a, there's a, uh, we could, we could talk for a long time about coronavirus, but this is FinTech for breakfast, even though it's not, not breakfast time. <laughs> will be by the time we put it out. Right now. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I mean, I could respond to that fully, but I actually do have quite a lot of sympathy for that for that point of view, and I think we really do need to look at that and um, examine whether the because uh, it's not just because I think there's a kind of false thing between like those who think that the, that, that the economy should be prioritised and those who think that lives should be prioritised. But the point that you're making, Andrew, which is the point that I've been making as well recently, is that uh, you know that the economy, the, the kind of impact on from the kind of economic collapse is also going to have an impact on on lives. So you kind of can't kind of you can't you have to kind of take that into consideration. Uh, and I think that the scientist, like Neil Ferguson, who leads the Imperial team, has kind of spoken about that already himself. But obviously, that's not his particular kind of field. But I think it is. It is very important that we consider that. Anyway, should we go on to fintech? Yep. Um, so, so you just talked about uh, Revolut and Monzo um, refuting rumours of an imminent collapse. So apparently there have been some, some rumours on social media circulating that, um, that they're facing financial difficulties um, as a result of the um, coronavirus outbreak. Um, given that these are loss-making firms, as we know, I mean, uh, as we've discussed many times at CSFI, pretty much all the fintechs are loss-making, bar a very small uh, handful, one of which we'll come to later, which has actually just posted its first ever loss, or first first loss since 2005 anyway. Um, but so, so the idea is that kind of, you know, uh, these, these firms that aren't making any profits are going to have their kind of funding options dry up. Um, and the kind of, you know, in the kind of new, uh, you know, downturn that we're, we're in and going to be kind of um, going, going to be in for, for what looks like a kind of considerable amount of time, that uh, the kind of hopes of some of these fintechs to IPO, etc. are going to be 
um, are going to be kind of dashed. And um, there was some research done by um, Rosenblatt Securities that said uh, that there's going to be a kind of devastating impact in terms of the valuation. And they reckoned that um, the downturn would wipe out $76 billion worth of, um, of the market value of, of fintech unicorns. Um, and that they would have to be, they would kind of be forced into um, m and uh, So anyway, so that's the kind of uh, backdrop. Um, uh, Revolut's uh, CEO, Nikolai Storonsky, said, uh, you know, this is nonsense. Um, he says, obviously, this can cause alarm. But to put your mind at ease, I'll quote, to put your mind at ease, I'd like to make Revolut's position super clear. Last month, we raised 500 million from investors. So I want to make clear for Revolut is business as usual. Uh, which I thought was kind of funny because, I mean, they've just raised such a kind of obscene amount of money. But of course, a kind of short-term hit from a downturn doesn't affect, doesn't affect them, given that, you know, they're, you know, they're not making any profits anyway. So, um, the, the, you know, of course, current, in the current kind of uh, environment, there's, there's no cause for kind of immediate concern. And Monzo has said something similar. Tom Blomfield said, Monzo's not going bust, source, I am the CEO. Uh, so they're both kind of, obviously they've, 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 both companies have got enough cash washing around. But I guess the idea is that we have had some quite sky high valuations for fintechs. And we've been in this kind of 11 year bull run and that's all been jolly and good. Um, but I do think that there is now uh, a danger and that some of these valuations are going to start to uh, come off a cliff, maybe. What about Oak North? Oak North have, um, so there's another story on this list uh, from Oak North. Let me just go to it. Um, so they, they've, they've, uh, they're still profitable. So they're, it's, it, Oak North are a really interesting one because they're like the most boring fintech. And I think it's kind of like, they're almost not a fintech. If you, go, if you go onto their website, they don't even look like a fintech. So I think it's kind of funny that we call them a fintech. I mean, it's funny that we call all of these companies fintechs in some ways in my, in my, from my point of view, just given that what are they doing that's that really that innovative with technology and just because they might be app-led doesn't mean that they're, uh, you know, technology. Um, but Oak North really doesn't even try and pretend, you know, it doesn't even try and give its, its branding a kind of fintech-y feel. But nevertheless, it seems to be one of the only profitable ones. So it's, um, it doubled its profit, profits in 2019, um, but it slowed its uh, pace of, of, of expansion. Um, and it also suffered its first two defaults in 2019, um, which it says was partly potentially a result of, of, um, of Brexit and, and the kind of the Brexit uncertainty we, that we had in 2019. Um, we also had a general election, etc. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, I think, um, I think to go back to Monzo and Revolut, they are, uh, looking, you know, they, they are kind of being defensive, but I think it is, it, and, and, you know, they're pointing out that they're very well equipped to work from home, et cetera, and that the current climate, like I said, doesn't, isn't going to affect them immediately. I think over the medium to long term, this is going to affect them actually. Um, and so that's my tuppence as well. I don't know. The, if they other, the other FinTech you've mentioned in this group is N26 and it's uh, customer blunders and recessions at the top behind its failed expansion. Um, let just say a few words on, on N26 and then I'll ask, uh, I'll ask Leighton to come in and talk, give his view on these as well. Sure, yeah. So N26 is this Berlin-based um, bank that's kind of, uh, unlike Monzo and Revolut, has kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, marketed itself as a bank from the start. So it's kind of uh, managed to get a kind and of- And Europe's of biggest fintech, right? Or it was. Uh, no, it's not anymore. Now, now uh, I mean, it depends how you measure size, but actually, oh. actually, uh, Revolut and Klarna are now uh, head, you know, equally uh, the biggest. So they're both 5.5 billion. But I mean, you know. <laughs> but Klarna, Klarna does nothing more than Bright House did, and Bright House went broke. Well, Klarna has been profitable for 15 years in a row, and it's only just posted its first uh, year of losses. So mm -hmm. actually, Klarna is like one of the only fintechs that actually makes money. Um, Isn't it an appalling business model? I mean, it's, it's higher purchase. It, it, you know, I'm old enough to remember, and this was a dirty word. Yeah, I mean, and apparently it's, get, it's coming under increased scrutiny um, in Sweden because it is, you know, it is kind of, the way it makes money is by people who are probably the most vulnerable in society not managing to, to pay 
uh, back the money on time. So uh, yeah, I do think it has quite a questionable business model. But to return to um, N26, so yeah, so they, they, uh, they're at this Berlin-based bank that um, have done quite well in Europe and um, came to uh, the UK in late 2018 after, uh, obviously long after the Brexit vote, over two years after the Brexit vote, uh, had a huge kind of marketing campaign what were kind of the, the the initial kind of um the initial news was that they were doing very well that they'd done very well on their premium account but lots of people were signing up um as i pointed out at the time uh one of the reasons i think they were doing so well is because they were giving away so many freebies it's not very hard to do extremely well if you're giving away lots of freebies one of the things they were giving away was uh, this this um, membership to um, WeWork, which at the time was seen as really cool. These days, you know, WeWork's reputation isn't quite as good as it was back then. But uh, they were giving this um, this once a month, uh, one day a month use of WeWork, which I think was probably quite a kind of uh, nice thing for people. That that wasn't even something that you could get from from WeWork themselves, and it was probably worth more than the the the, the fifteen pounds a month that the uh, that the premium account was worth but so what has emerged so 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 what's happened with n26 is last month so february 2020 they say that they are no longer they're closing down their uh, uk operations uh, and they say that the reason is because they're unable to operate in the uk with its uh, with a U european banking license which is kind of bs because we you know they 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 launched in the uk in 2018 which as i said is more than two years after the brexit vote so it looks like that was a bit of an excuse and what this sifted story, which is on here, um, on this list that we have, uh, reveals is that they were actually having quite a lot of issues um, and that these might have been, because the, 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 the chat was that actually they just hadn't done very well in the UK in terms of customer numbers. Uh, but actually, it looks like they were also having some, some other issues. Um, so, for example, they had a run-in with the, um, the FCA, um, who, who were kind of accusing them of um, unintentionally mis-selling travel insurance. So, uh, ap apparently, according to UK law, um, which seems like a good rule, customers have to be eligible for the, travel in for the insurance they're being sold. Um, but N26 were kind of selling this um, this blanket insurance uh, for um, as part of their um, this travel insurance as part of their um, metal premium account, and uh, because they didn't have people's medical records, some of those users with with um, you know uh, ex pre existing conditions wouldn't have actually been eligible for that insurance, and so they were basically kind of mis selling this insurance. And the one thing this made me think of, uh, which, and by the way, we don't actually know whether they were actually ever fined by the FCA, but this seems to have been an issue. But, it, it, but Revolut have a similar uh, thing with, with, with insurance. And you can, with Revolut, you can pay per day. And I'd be curious to know whether Revolut is, in, in fact, if it wasn't, you know, if we weren't in the middle of the coronavirus, I might dig into that a bit to see whether Revolut are actually also mis-selling with their travel insurance. Because I don't know how many... Uh, medical records they require before um, before selling people that. So I think some of the high street banks also offer that kind of insurance deal on premium accounts. But yeah, that, and I wonder. Yeah, so I wonder how because it. Yeah, I because it seems like insurance is quite often a kind of add on to premium accounts. And, yeah. uh, well, you any, any any views on on neo and digital banking? Is this uh, or so latent? Yeah. As, as, so yeah, I, I thought this the Monzo um, and Revolut rumor of collapse story. It was more interesting because it, it sort of addressed the um, questions over that as a sustainable business model. Um, and you know, I, I, they're probably not going to go bust tomorrow. But it's just, and it's just a point. You know, how long can these companies um, sustain not making profits? Oh, um, this is, you know, you can't, you can't budget for a pandemic you can't budget for an apocalyptic event like this that seems a bit unfair that they they can't survive a, a global pandemic no I, I i agree um it's 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 really you know which firms um they're not the only firms in fintech um some are some are profitable and oak north is one of them um and it, it and azimo and transferwise are also making a lot of a lot of money um, and I think it it goes to the question of what are they what where are they getting their value from 
And I mean, Revolut is valued more uh, at a higher higher level than Oak North uh, transfer-wise and Azimo, and it's difficult to justify that in many ways because yeah. they're, they're not making any money. Okay, it always was difficult to justify the valuations of these companies. <laughs> but leaving that aside, let's move on to cryptos and digital uh, digital currencies. Um, you, what what were you flagging on that, Leighton? So. Um, I was. This was something I really wanted to uh, push in J uh, Jemima's direction, but I, I did see. Um, I, I read her pieces, and there was a very interesting thing. And it's this was on the crypto collapse gets cataclysmic, and there was a really interesting chart that's uh, of the ten most traded uh, cryptocurrencies, and only one of them had gone up, uh, which was Tether, and I was just, all the others went down by. 10 15 percent since the um since the crisis maybe it's more now i don't know well, that was just in a 24 hour in a 24 hour period and i should point out that tether is supposed to stay completely stable because tether is a so-called stable coin which is pegged to the dollar uh and apparently there's been this you know there's been this huge controversy over tether over the past few years because people haven't really believed that they have the money to back up now, so they've always said that they're fully reserved uh, sorry, fully backed up by um, reserves, um, and so they. Uh, but then it's kind of become, it's come to light, and there's lo there's been lots of accusations that they haven't been, and it's come to light in the last year or so that actually they've been almost fully backed, but not quite. And then it came to light that actually some of their reserves were in Bitcoin. Well, you can imagine that with Bitcoin plunging, the fact that their reserves are in Bitcoin is not you know, means that actually what's backing up your your kind of tether your kind of fake dollar is actually not worth anywhere near your fake, what a real dollar is worth so that that was why uh, it was interesting that um that tether was kind of going up in in that kind of context but, but has bitcoin actually plunged during the coronavirus um yeah. so, so um so are we going to, we're moving on to, we haven't completely done all the stories, by the way, on the neobanks, but we can come back to those. Okay, no, no, if, if, if there's something that you want to say, well, come in. Um, okay, just before I, okay, well, two things then, uh, just before we go on to, to cryptocurrency, seeing as we don't have, we don't have the normal audience participation, so we have maybe a little more time, okay. maybe. Um, so just, I mean, you said just one thing, uh, like you said, that it's not fair to expect these companies, these firms to be prepared for a pandemic. Obviously, I, to some extent, to a large extent, agree. Um, that's, but, the, but the point is we were having a kind of, we were, it was an un unprecedented bull run. And I think my view has been for a long time that these, these, these valuations have been quite detached from reality in, in the kind of style of the kind of, not, not, not quite so, so extreme but in the kind of style of the dot-com bubble um and so i don't think it's unfair to to kind of think that some of these firms should have thought about the kind of current circumstances being a little bit too rosy and that they weren't going to continue forever so the reason that that, that, that uh you know that that revolut and monzo are potentially threatened is not because of a pandemic obviously it's because of a global downturn and yes that's steeper than we we could have imagined for probably you know we're not there yet so we don't know but we imagine it we, we 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 think that it's going to be steeper than before but you know it we we still knew a downturn was coming eventually you know that's just the way that economic cycles work so so i think that's just come back on that um moving on to the um uh to the to the to the to, the, to revolute's valuation because we've kind of briefly discussed that but we haven't kind of discussed the story uh that was on this list about that so um so yeah, so they've just raised $500 million, which has been something we've been waiting for for a very long time. Um, that was a Series D round. So that gives them a $5.5 .5 billion valuation, which means, as I say, that uh, they're equally the most highly valued fintech in Europe alongside um, Klarna. Uh, as Kat Ratapuli pointed out in her Lombard column on this, um, there is a kind of, as she put it, like a finger in the air thing of you know about these fintech valuations and it does seem like a quite a com kind of competitive kind of valuation um game where you know each each fintech wants to be the most highly valued so it doesn't seem to be a coincidence that revolut just so happened to be valued at 5.5 .5 billion which is the same as klarna um and it seems to me that this kind of you know these we you said earlier andrew is isn't N26 the biggest fintech in europe it was you know like 18 months ago or something but it seems like you know 
it's just the like, the last person to have a have a fundraising round that gets to be like the biggest fintech because they're the ones who've had the most recent valuation. So it might be the N26 are actually bigger than this by now, but obviously we don't know because they haven't just had a valuation. Um, so, uh, but this story in Sifted talks about how the valuation of Revolut is kind of similar to Plaid, um, which is this um, fintech, US fintech that was recently acquired by Visa for 5.3 billion. So almost, almost the same amount. Uh, and their revenues are kind of 100 to 200 million um, a year, which is similar to Revolut's, which is um, uh, around, uh, they reckon around 170 million uh, pounds. So they're both roughly um, valued around 25%, so 25 times of their annual revenue. But it seems to me that Plaid has a much more kind of obvious path to profitability then Revolut, um, Plaid uh, kind of develops financial uh, services APIs. It's a bit like what Stripe does um, for payments. So it enables um, it enables uh, developers to share um, banking and, and financial information. No one else is doing it. It's a kind of B2B uh, kind of business. I just think it's much more kind of obvious that that would be, and they've got like something like 20,000 uh, they have t- sorry. They have connections with with over ten thousand banks, and they reach more than twenty million uh, consumer bank accounts. They've got like a massive reach, um, and they're not trying to kind of get rid of anyone. They're just kind of providing a kind of new service that sits in between. So I think that they've got a much more kind of obvious path to profitability than someone like Revolut that's kind of competing against a whole enormous not just not just bunch of challenger banks but also bank banks so uh i think the fact that it is valued in line with with plaid in terms of the revenue is probably shows that it is overvalued um and also as Leighton pointed out like the fact that it's kind of way you know it's it's priced more highly than all its profit making peers is also kind of seems a bit off in my in my opinion Okay. So that's, that's on Revolut. Oh, and they've also now Michael Sherwood, who, who has finally joined the board. He's the European, um, the former European co-head of Goldman Sachs and was kind of one of the people who was tipped to be, uh, to, to replace Lloyd Blankfein. Obviously, um, he didn't, um, David Solomon did. So, so they've, they're kind of upping their game in terms of, um, you know, trying to get, trying to become kind of legit, um, although at the same time, they also had some um, issues with uh, accidentally freezing the accounts of a um, French company, um, accidentally freezing 300,000 euros. So because of money laundering issues, so that doesn't look too good for their kind of the way that they're handling compliance. So uh, so that's just to, to kind of finish off on the neo banks. I think there were. OK, back to the cryptos then. But, uh, Crypto. Yeah. Oh, you're breaking up a bit. Is that just for me, or did you? No, well, we were we started on it. You were you were saying the collapse of of, Bit, of Bitcoin. I was saying has has Bitcoin actually collapsed that much since the coronavirus came in? Uh, I mean, it wasn't. It was trading at whatever it was thirteen thousand. Went down to six thousand dollars. I thought it was floating around that area now, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's around six, six, six and a half thousand dollars. It did actually go down to something like three and a half thousand uh, overnight at one point, which was. Um, but that's quite a big collapse you know from going as you say uh, to kind of it was above 10,000 to now six and a half thousand that's like, but not related to the coronavirus oh no it is absolutely so so um bitcoin is obviously as we know is often frequently has in the past frequently been touted as kind of digital gold and um people have uh, thought that it could be a kind of safe haven because it um supposedly is kind of um, apart from the rest of the financial system and so isn't exposed to the same uh, kind of um, sentiments and you know while central banks can print loads of money and inflate their value of their currencies away bitcoin is immune to that because bitcoin doesn't have a central bank printing money Um, unfortunately uh, the way in which and i think you could actually argue that bitcoin has been the victim of its own success because Perhaps in the early days, it could have responded a bit like a safe haven, or at least, um, at least, kind of wouldn't have been very correlated to 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 other markets, given that the people buying it were kind of nerds in their bedrooms who weren't kind of day traders or whatever. Nowadays, I mean, I I argue against the idea that Bitcoin has become kind of institutionalized because um, I think it has become more mainstream, but I don't think it's kind of entered institutional invest investment. In other words, like pension funds and kind of mainstream mutual funds, insurance companies, et cetera. But I do think it's become much more 
something that quite a lot of day traders and kind of traditional investors might have like a little bit of their portfolio in, right? Therefore, if you have the whole market sliding massively, as we did on that particular day that I wrote the article about the crypto, about crypto collapsing, um, you know, the biggest falls in the Dow Jones since I've forgotten when, was it ever? And I mean, like the highest ever um, VIX volatility index reading. I mean, just insane, the kind of insane gyrations that we've seen in financial markets, particularly two weeks ago. Um, it's kind of quietened down a little now. Uh, when that was all happening, Bitcoin just slid in complete positive correlation with all the stocks and other kind of risk assets, um, like commodities, um, oil, etc. cetera. Oil has, has its slightly own story, as we know. But um, so the, the idea is that, that, so what I'm saying is actually the fact that it has become more mainstream means that people just want to dump anything risky when it looks like the world is collapsing. So people were dumping stocks, people were dumping Bitcoin. It's just as simple as that. And also there's been a real, um, you know, worry about accessing cash and, you know, you can't really pay for anything with Bitcoin. So, so does, 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 does that mean that you think it could be the digital equivalent of gold? not a currency what do you mean so like uh you're saying it's sort of a maybe not a hedge or maybe a hedge to can just... it be a safe haven yeah yeah okay well it depends what some okay it depends what we mean by safe haven obviously it's for a start it's not very safe because as we know it's incredibly vulnerable to to i mean because it, because unfortunately we it does rely on on intermediaries to actually function because you need exchanges and wallet providers and all the rest of it we know that it's actually very vulnerable to 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 hacks and thefts etc so the idea of it being safe when it's so when it's so often hacked i think is a bit ridiculous but um i guess the 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 time in which you could see it as a safe haven is if you're living in a country where you know there was where your your currency was rapidly like de being devalued and if you could have access to Bitcoin, um, then that could provide you with some sort of safe haven, even though it's massively volatile. I mean, it's more volatile. It's been more volatile in recent weeks than stocks have, and stocks have been the most volatile they've ever been. So, it's so the idea that it's safe when it's that volatile, I think, is uh, a bit of a nonsense. Um, a, a safe haven relies on it. What, what a safe haven needs is for the whole world to believe it's a safe haven, right? Yeah. Like, so if, if everyone believes it's a safe haven, then it will go up at a time of, of, of risk aversion. But clearly everyone believes it's a risk asset, which is why it sells off at a time of risk aversion. If everyone thought it was a safe haven, then it would go up. Like, you like, said earlier that Tether went up. Yeah, Tether went up just very, very, it was just that like, it was a sea of red. Leighton said, as Leighton said, I put a table on my story that just showed a sea of red. I mean, it was a 24-hour table showing like all the major cryptocurrencies falling like yeah, 10 to 15 percent in in 24 hours. That wasn't in the whole since the whole beginning of the crisis. It's much more than that. Yeah. And that means that something else is inside its sort of composite. Sort of, it's not just linked to the dollar. Is that what you're? No, that's not what that means. It's just we know that it's it's just it, it's just funny that that Bit, that that Tether was trading slightly. It was yeah. supposed to be worth one dollar. It was trading at one one dollar and two cents a lot of exchanges are only accept so don't accept any fiat currency whatsoever so a lot of exchanges you can only if you want to get dollars you have to first exchange them into tethers mm -hmm. which so the, the the fact that it was trading at 102 suggests that there was desperation on those crypto exchanges to get their money back into dollars that's what that suggests the thing about whether it's uh whether it was backed or not isn't the, the price doesn't reflect whether or not it's backed it's, it's just an exit strategy for those nerds who yeah. trade in their in their bedroom what else in the crypto area and, we, and then we'll move on to payments uh, so there was another story on here about a company called e-payment systems which um i think is is quite an interesting one um so they're not not specifically crypto but they do deal with crypto and they also have uh their 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 founder is, has also got kind of crypto links so basically on the 11th of february e, so e-payments i don't know have, you, have either of you ever heard of e-payments before no nope. i no. haven't heard. no so they're like a really not known about i think i made maybe slightly flagged this story in our last fintech for breakfast um briefly because i think maybe i was just writing it or something but so they're actually one of the biggest e-payments companies in the uk and no one's ever heard of them 
Uh, that might be partly to do with some of the clients that they serve. They, um, their main clients are actually, um, well, crypto is one of them, but also the adult entertainment industry seems to be a massive, massive pool of clients, not just in the UK, kind of globally. Uh, and so they are licensed as an e-money firm um, by the FCA. But on February the 11th, they were ordered to freeze all their operations, um, which is over a million uh, individual accounts and over a thousand business accounts. Um, so quite a lot of, uh, of people. They're actually an extremely profitable company as well, by the way. They, um, they made, in the last financial year, they made 18 million uh, on revenues of almost 28 million, um, to six percent gross profit margin. So anyway, so like extremely profitable. Um, but they have some interesting, um, people involved. So, so basically they were told that they had to suspend all their accounts by an, for an indefinite period by the FCA, um, because of a number of weaknesses in their money laundering, um, controls. So this means we don't actually know how much is, how much money is stuck. But there have been, I was actually told um, by a guy I spoke to that he would, I mean, it's really horrendous that he, he had put a huge amount, he, I think it was $10,000, um, which he said he was using to pay for his son's uh, medical bills, which were critical. And he was saying that he was, you know, he was talking about suicide because of not being able to access this money. Um, so that was $54,000 that he had stuck in his account. We don't know how much was stuck in total, but we do know that when they lasted their accounts, according to Companies House, they were holding 127 million of clients' money. So it's likely they've got like a fair amount of, of, of people's money. It's probably more than that because they've been growing. Um, so and as far as I know, they, no customer has been, been able to access their money still the last time I checked. So this has been going on um, over you know, almost two months now. But this is, this is the action of the FCA to, to freeze it. The action of the FCA. FCA. The FCA haven't given me any more, um, ha haven't kind of commented further on it. One of the things that came to light from it was something quite interesting that I think we've discussed at CSFI before, which is that people, there is a real lack of awareness about the difference between an e-money firm and a bank in terms of what is covered if you lose your deposit. If you have a bank, if you have a bank account at Revolut in the UK, your money is not guaranteed because it's not part of the deposit guarantee scheme because Revolut does not have a UK banking license. And so with Monzo, you are guaranteed because, it, and, and actually they've just opened, they've just started, Revolut has finally entered the US and they've got deposit guarantee there only because they've got, they're not actually providing the banking services. They're doing that through a US bank. Uh, and that gives you up to $250,000. So that's quite a big deposit guarantee. But anyway, so, so e-payments has no deposit guarantee. And I had the people I spoke, the kind of clients of, of, of e-payments told me that they didn't realize that this was the case. They said, one person said, oh, I thought it was an FCA regulated company. The money must be secured, you know? So there's quite a lot of, um, upset over the fact that kind of, you know, it had this FCA label and yet people can't access their money. It also seems a bit kind of heavy handed from the, the FCA. I mean, the whole point of, you know, shouldn't it be kind of trying to, I don't know, like the, the fact that it's been like over six weeks that these people haven't been able to access their money. Like the whole point of the FCA is to kind of protect customers from that kind of thing. So it seems a bit unfair. Um, it was founded by this guy who also has founded, as I say, a, um, a crypto exchange. He's a, a Russian guy called um, Mike Rumanov. Um, but, but, but the really interesting connection is here. And this is where, I mean, we don't have any, as I say, the FCA hasn't said anything further than this. Um, but uh, so there's a, um, so Robert Courtnage is a guy, who, a former lawyer who actually resigned straight after the suspension from the FCA. So he's now no longer at, um, at e-payments. He resigned a couple of days after the FCA suspension. Um, he's the CEO of a payments company called, oh, sorry, e -money, e -money, another e-money firm called Morewand. But he was also previously um, at a law firm called Locklord, where he was considered the expert on crypto. Now, Locklord is the firm that Ruja Ignatova, who is the missing crypto queen from the famous and excellent BBC uh, podcast, she used Locklord as her uh, that, you know, that was the law, the law firm she used. And Mark Scott, who was one of the partners in the US office, um, was found guilty in November of laundering $400 million uh, for one coin. Uh, and he's now facing up to, he's now in prison and facing up to um, 50 years in jail. Now, he wasn't the crypto expert at Locklord, 
Robert Courtnage was. And Robert Courtnage is the guy who was the, who was a director at ePayments. So it's a bit of a kind of strange story. Uh, he was the director at ePayments until he's just resigned. Um, we don't know if this has got anything to do with, um, and, and there was, and if you look at the court transcripts um, for, for the Mark Scott case, so this is the other um, lawyer at Lock Lord, uh, a lot of the kind of court, um, one of the emails from the court, from, from that came up in the court case was from Dr. Ruja Ignatova to Robert Courtnage, this e-payments guy, and Mark Scott saying, I have some cash with me, about £220 GBP. Can you store it for me in London? Best, Ruja. And that went to Robert Courtnage, but Robert Courtnage hasn't been accused of anything, but he was clearly involved in one coin. Um, I've asked uh, about him, uh, I've asked him about his involvement. He has said he's unable to comment, um, but clearly, and sorry, and some of the things in the court, in the, in the court, doc, in the court documents, it came up that um, there had been that, you know, how could, you know, people were asking how Robert Courtnage wouldn't have known about this, wouldn't have known that this was um, effectively a fraud scheme but he hasn't actually at this time been accused of anything so it's just an in, a very very interesting uh i mean i'm quite interested in this whole the, i mean the scale of the one coin scam is just un, 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 incredible and um I, I, I there is a potential link here but we have no idea whether that is anything to do with why this um this company has had its accounts frozen okay let's let's move on to payments more generally yes Okay. Um, What's, what, what, we, what we were you trying to flag in the agenda? So um, this was really interesting because uh, there were two, two main things. Firstly, um, there's been a, there will be a rise on April 1st um, with, from £30 to £45 on the uh, maximum contact list limit, um, which I think was sort of pent up and they were going to raise it eventually anyway. But the COVID-19 issue um, around fears over access to cash, which may be unfounded, um, but also um, around hygiene, around exchange of money. Um, and I had, there's, uh, in one of the articles I, I put on here, um, it says that, you know, that there, there is dis there, the numbers are disputed over, over how, uh, how long, you know, uh, this virus or the uh, germs or whatever can stay on coins and, and uh, paper currency. I think the highest was 17 days, but it, it just seems really interesting because we're, it's, it's sort of uh, accelerating change. And we had, a, we had an event on, on you know, contact. Coronavirus makes us all go cashless. I mean, the yeah. catch with, with the, uh, the tap and go is that I, I, it makes me feel terribly old and terribly, terribly conservative. But it sort of, you know, 40, whatever it is, 45 pounds will become just throwing away money. And I don't know what, what that will do. Certainly it gets us out, it helps to get us out of the coronavirus crisis. But thereafter, I don't know. It's... Uh, but it's do you think they will... It's one of those... Uh, Jemima. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that, that some of the data from this, um, this story about us going cashless um, was kind of interesting. Um, I'm not sure whether it's kind of, there was some data from this um, ATM network link that says that cash usage, usage in Britain has halved um, and it comes as most, as people move to contactless payments. I mean, for me, the main, the obvious reason for why cash, cash usage in Britain has halved you know, cash withdrawing money from an ATM has half. I mean, have, have, have either of you withdrawn um, cash from an ATM in recent days? There's no. nowhere to spend it. There's nowhere to spend it. We're all locked indoors. So that's the, to me, that was a kind of weird bit of kind of a weird statistic to use to tell that story because it's like, but surely the reason we're not withdrawing cash is because we're not spending any money anywhere rather than that we were all decided that cash is, is actually covered in in coronavirus because presumably the, the cash that you get from the bank isn't as likely to be particularly uh, from from the atm sorry particularly uh particularly the notes given that it's metal that we know is the more of a kind of where uh, you know a surface that the virus likes to settle on more than more than paper i think um but i i, I thought that was kind of interesting because clearly that's the reason we're not getting cash out is because there's nowhere to spend it i mean i find the i find the really interesting thing about this that you know we're Will we will we revert to our previous behaviour? Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, will we? You know, why? If we're happy, I mean, I've I've for the first few times used my phone to pay for things, 
Um, I know that sounds very unmillennial of me, but it was very, uh, or whatever I am, I'm a gen, I think I'm millennial. But yeah, it's, it's just like, it, it just seemed like what, once we have that inbuilt use and we've downloaded the app and, you know, why would we go back to that? The things that we did use cash for were casual payments like news agents, coffee shops. And I agree, your generation didn't use cash that much anyway, but that was where cash was being used. It wasn't being used in supermarkets. People weren't pulling out wads of notes even there. They were, they were using credit cards or debit cards or what have you. Yeah. Um, I, I, I use cash to pay the nail salon, who's now, who's now closed, and to pay the cleaner, who's now not, not well, <laughs> Max Mum will be after you. <laughs> she is gonna come. No, she tells me she pays her taxes, but she is gonna come when I'm out of this house. She's not a weekly. By the way, everyone should still be paying their cleaners. Sorry, just a little breach. I could find one. All right, continue. Uh, so, okay. Um, uh, so we talked about Plana. Yep. Um, Talk about wise partners with Alipay. This was something that Leighton brought up at the beginning. Yeah. So um, yeah. So they've they've um, partnered with Alipay uh, for international transfers, which means that now transfer wise, seven million more than seven million users um, will be able to send uh, Chinese yuan um, from seventeen different currencies um, into to users of Alipay, Alipay, which will then get directly transferred to the, those users. Um, Bank accounts. Um, apparently, as well, China is projected to be one of the top remit remittance recipients companies in the world, um, with 54 billion expected in the next year. But, I mean, to me, it's really surprising that it's not already the top recipient of remittances in a while. Well, this is this is this has to do with the Belt and Road Initiative, but it is Chinese moving out on the tentacles of the Belt and Road Initiative and then sending yeah. the money back home because they don't spend it in whatever country they happen to find themselves in. Yeah, but it's kind of surprising that hasn't already made, meant it's kind of made, made it already the kind of top remittance market, just given how many people live there and given the spread of the Chinese government. I don't know, that was, that was kind of interesting to me. Um, apparently it's also, um, so Starling, so TransferWise have kind of not done kind of business partnerships particularly successfully, according to this um, piece in TechCrunch. They pointed out that um, Starling had dropped them in 2018. They do actually have a, a, a quite a successful, as far as I know, uh, relationship with Monzo. They're the ones who underlie the um, uh, for, uh, international transfers. Who does this for Starling then? I'm sorry? Who, who does it for Starling then? Uh, I don't know actually who does it now. Um, not sure. Don't know if they do it themselves or if they use someone like Currency Cloud who does a lot of in-text. I wouldn't be surprised if they used Currency Cloud. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so this is kind of, um, a, a kind of good, you know, as TechCrunch was saying, a kind of, um, you know, a bit of smart business for a company that hasn't always managed to, to kind of, um, forge partnerships. Um, it did also recently also forge a partnership with GoCardless, um, which is, um, a London fintech, um, that, uh, was kind of a direct debit, um, type fintech. Um, <laughs> One thing that, that I'm concerned about is that the big payment companies are withholding payments to companies that they believe to be in trouble. Uh, and I hadn't understood that the big, big payment companies would pass through the funds that they got, the big card, card processing companies didn't pass through the payments that they got immediately, but they hold afloat. And this was one of the problems with Flybee um, some months, a couple of months ago, and it is quite likely that this could exacerbate the, the problems that, that large corporate, large companies face at the present time. You oh, said I, carefully. I didn't know about that. I'd have to, uh, I'll ask Izzy about that. She... Have a look at it. Okay. Uh, we have, we, we're actually going to come up for a, an hour very, very soon. So um, very, there's just a couple of things. What would you pick out of you, AI and your bonus material? You. There is a, a piece here saying that glitchy coronavirus markets cause quant funds to misfire. Is that an important story? Um, it's an FT story, so of course it's an important story. <laughs> um, I think it's interesting because kind of these funds are kind of seen as these like, you know, 
you know, um, faultless kind of going to make money in whatever, whatever kind of uh, environment they're in, whether it's up or down, you know, they can go long and short, they can make money wherever they are. Uh, it's a bit of a reality check, you know, um, Renaissance Technologies, which is one of the big, big um, quant fund companies, um, has lost uh, its flagship institutional equities fund has, um, has, has uh, year to date, its losses are 24%, which is quite steep. Um, so I think it's kind of, you know, a, uh, as I say, a bit of a reality check for these quant funds who have done remarkably well. They managed to survive a fair bit of volatility in 2018 um, when the war is about. What's that? that? They eat volatility. That is what they live on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Bonus material. Any of these other stories? Elon Musk doesn't get it. Oh, uh, God. Don't get me started on Elon Musk. Elon Musk is a. Uh, he really doesn't get it. As I wrote, that was my story. He's just, um, he is, I think he's being incredibly irresponsible, to be honest. He's got like 33 million followers on Twitter and he is just spouting. He's, I think there's a, there's, there's a real rise of, I might do a story actually on the rise of the, uh, I'm not the first person to use this phrase, but the, the rise of the armchair um, epide epidemiologist. epidemiologist. Um, you know, people like Elon Musk are, have decided that they, you know, he's, an, he's an, an, obviously an extremely intelligent man who doesn't have a specialty in infectious disease. And so he should just let the experts talk. And he is, he is telling his 33 million followers that, for example, I don't know how you pronounce that. I always just write it. Chloroquine, the stuff that the malaria drug. Mm -hmm. chloroquine that, that Donald Trump has also advocated which could also kill a person if you ingest just two grams of it he said oh you know he's kind of tweeted about the benefits of that he's he's tweeted that the, the, that the panic around coronavirus is dumb he's tweeted that the panic is more dangerous than coronavirus itself someone said to him look mate couldn't you create us couldn't you make us some ventilators and he said I will if there's a shortage which was an incredibly stupid thing to say given that we already have a shortage of ventilators in many countries and we're heading, you know, we, we are aware that all of our countries, you know, we've had Matt Hancock saying, we'll give, we'll pay, you know, no number is too big, whatever, you know, if you make a ventilator, we will buy it. Uh, and now apparently Elon Musk has bought a whole load of ventilators from China and has given them to the U S to the, like the state of California, which seems odd. I don't know why the state of California can buy their own ventilators if it was that easy um anyway i'm not you know if he's if he's trying to help then that's brilliant and i and i don't want to detract from that but this so far he's shown he's shown signs of being incredibly ignorant and and reckless and irresponsible in what he's sharing and in fact he retweeted um a whole thread by this former new york times journalist called alex berenson who's actually been responsible for spreading much of the misinformation that i was talking about at the start in terms of these imperial models and whether whether or not they've been revised from their original which they haven't they've just it's just a misunderstanding and elon musk has retweeted this entire thread that has now been debunked completely by people like me and the professor who has actually who actually wrote the report has tweeted my re report saying this is exactly this is what this is this is this is correct and the guy is still retweeting this anyway so okay. All right, the last thing that you have on this list, which I gather is not one that you have been following, is that China and Huawei are proposing the reinvention of the internet, the re-architecturing of the internet around the International Telecommunications Union, a UN body. Some people in China think that this is a necessary restructuring of the internet to make it fit for 5G. Others outside China think it's a, uh, a power grab by the Chinese government and that will enable other governments as well to control the internet going forward. Do you have a view on that or is this something that you are worried about? As we know, you know, the coronavirus is really just about 5G anyway, so it's not joking. <laughs> That's the biggest conspiracy theory out there. Now, Andrew, I don't, wanna, I don't want to uh, have a view on that when I feel like I don't. But you will have a view on it next, next time, time we meet. Next time I'll have a view on it which I hope will be roughly this time next month. Can I thank Jemima, Jemima Kelly from FT Alphaville? Can I thank my colleague, Leighton Hughes? And can I thank anybody who went to the end of this and listened to all of it? Uh, we'll see you again next month. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.